My name is Amanda Thomas, and I would love to welcome you to Science on Tap. We are here this evening to learn about a dog's world, imagining the lives of dogs in a world without humans. And we have two speakers with us tonight. They're the authors of this book. We have Jessica Pierce, who is a bioethicist and writer of several books on human animal interaction uh, and relationships particularly the obligations that arise in caring for and living well with companion animals. She is the faculty affiliate of the, at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical School. And we also have Mark Beckoff, who is a professor emeritus of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Colorado Boulder. His main areas of research have included animal behavior, cognitive ethology, which is the study of animal minds, behavioral ecology, and compassionate conservation. And he's also written extensively on human animal interactions and animal protection. So we're excited to have both of them here today. And uh, just just a few things, a few housekeeping items before we bring them on stage. First of all, you can purchase this book if you are uh, in Portland or anywhere. You can go to Broadway Books. Um, they are a local Portland bookstore here. And if you use the code STDOGSWORLD15 uh, and use the coupon code as you check out, you will get a 15% discount. Briefly, we here at Science on Tap, we are a uh, program, a event series that is based in Portland, Oregon. And here's what it used to look like when we were able to be in theaters. We do hope to be able to do that again soon. Um, we are, uh, our goals are to make science accessible, fun, and meaningful, especially for adults. We think it's really important that adults know about science as the last couple of years have really shown us. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and welcome our first speaker, Jessica Pierce. Please take it away, Jessica. So welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight. Um, I would like to, um, before I really dig into the material, I would like to introduce a very important collaborator on this project. This is Bella. Um, she did a lot of um, back and forth of ideas as Mark and I were working on this and Mark put up with a lot of um, background conversation from Bella. So if you share your house with a dog, your life with a dog, you may have found yourself clicking your tongue or rolling your eyes at some ridiculously unwild behavior. You might have a dog who tiptoes through rain puddles, or who, um, despite all attempts, um, is totally unsuccessful at chasing squirrels, who complains about sore paws on a hike. And you might have found yourself gently chiding your dog, you know, you would never survive without me. But if you were to phrase this as a serious question for your dog, you know, do you really think you would be able to survive on your own without my help? Um, your dog might say, sure, why not? You might press your dog for some details. You know, how would you keep warm? What would you eat? Um, what would you do when it rains? And most importantly, wouldn't you be lonely without me? Your dog might say to you, well, I would just go next door to the neighbor. And they would probably provide the basics of food, shelter, and probably even love. And you might uh, be somewhat annoyed with your dog and press, um, press your dog a little bit more and say, well, what if there were no, no next door neighbor? What if in fact there were no humans whatsoever? Then how would she manage? To which your dog might just sigh and say, use your imagination, which is what we tried to do in our book, A Dog's World. We invite readers into your dog's imaginary world in which humans have suddenly disappeared and dogs are on their own. In the book, we consider two key questions. Would dogs survive at all without their human counterparts? Are they still capable of living on their own 
as wild animals without help from and relationships with humans. And second, perhaps um, even more intriguing question, what are some of the possible evolutionary trajectories of post-human dogs? What would rewilding look like for dogs? Would they look or behave anything like um, the animals we now call our best friends? So on the first question, would dogs survive? Um, this was the easier of the two questions. If humans disappeared tomorrow, about a billion dogs would be left on their own. And the first clue to whether dogs would survive is in these billion or so dogs, and um, pull up a little pie diagram here. Um, so this is the first clue. Roughly 80% of these billion or so dogs on the world are already living on their own as free ranging dogs, some um, street dogs, feral dogs, um, community dogs, village dogs, and free roaming dogs. And only roughly 20% of the dogs on the planet live as what we call pet dogs or in, in the book we call um, intensively homed dogs. So, most of the dogs on the planet actually already are living without direct human support within a human homed environment. But although the world's 80, approximately 80 million or so free ranging dogs have a lot more independence of movement and behavior than the 2 million or so intensively home dogs and have developed a range of survival skills Almost all of these dogs rely on human presence for one key resource, and that is food subsidies, either in the form of direct feeding with handouts or in the, far, in the form of garbage and human waste. So the loss of these um, anthropogenic food resources would be a significant challenge for, for dogs in the immediate aftermath of human disappearance. And the tr transition years immediately after our disappearance would likely be um, quite challenging. However, after some rough years, dogs would um, adapt to life on their own. Dogs retain many of the traits and behaviors of their wild relatives, such as wolves, coyotes, and jackals. They haven't forgotten how to do things like forage, find mates, raise children, get along in groups, and defend themselves. So these skills would be put back to work. So the answer to our first question, would dogs survive is almost certainly yes. Um, an even more in interesting question is who might dogs become once decoupled from humans? Dogs and humans have lived in close association for at least 15,000 years, perhaps as many as 40,000 years or more. Um, scientists are still figuring this out. Dogs are the, the only canid species to have undergone domestication and were also the first animals to be domesticated by a pretty large margin um, and likely the only animal to have been do domesticated by hunter-gatherers with all other animals having been domesticated after the development of agriculture. The domestication process has strongly shaped the evolutionary trajectory of dogs up to this point. Um, it's also incidentally shaped the evolutionary trajectory of us. The phenotypic profile of dogs, so their morphology, their, their body shape, their physiology and their behavior. Um, in other words, who dogs are now is largely the result of their interaction with us and um, intentional human interference. So this is a sort of graphic image of, of our thought experiment here in evolutionary trajectories. So in a post-human future, this 20,000 odd year domestication experiment would abruptly stop. Human directed or artificial selection would cease and dogs would begin to drift in the currents of natural selection. And where these currents would take them is one of the great unknowns. And of course, we'll never know if we're not here, but still interesting to think about. Um, 
One of the things that people often say to us when we talk about our book is, oh, well, dogs would just go back to being wolves. Post-human dogs are um, whatever they become, they're not gonna go back to being wolves. Domestication, or sorry, evolution doesn't um, work in reverse like this. Uh, dogs are going to become something entirely or at least largely new. The ecological niches that post-human dogs inhabit will be vastly different from the niches that their progenitors filled without human presence. So to explore the possible evolutionary trajectories of post-human dogs, Mark and A made a chart of all the possible factors that we could think of that might influence the evolution of post-human dogs. And it, it was a very, very long chart. Um, I think it takes up three or four pages in the book. Um, tonight, we're just going to condense things down into five major categories. And I'm going to just mention them really briefly, um, partly um, just to be able to show you some slides that we were lucky enough to be able to reprint in the book of free ranging dogs. Um, almost all of the pictures in this section were taken by Marco Ada, who's studied dogs in Bali. So um, just a preview then of what is what Mark's going to talk about. And I'm going to, before Mark comes on, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the last part of the book, which is about ethics. So, um, so very briefly, uh, one of the, the first things that we wrote about in um, terms of evolutionary trajectories is um, has to do with food and feeding ecology. And that, as I've mentioned, the most consequential change for dogs in a post-human future is going to be the loss of human food resources, um, the presence of which may have been one of the key drivers of dog evolution, um, evolution from wolves. So if humans disappeared along with their garbage waste and um, grocery stores full of bagged dog kibble, dogs would quickly have to find other sources of food because dogs are behaviorally flexible and because they're dietary generalists, um, they would probably be able to solve this problem and could likely survive on a wide range of, of edibles from plants and berries and insects to small mammals, birds, and maybe even some larger prey. Um, their meal plans would depend on where they live, how big they are, and the shape of their body. In terms of, um, so the, the second part of most consequential area of change is um, in reproductive strategies. And I have a couple of, I'm arguably rather gratuitous. I, I had to show slides of puppies. So um, reproductive strategies are gonna have to evolve pretty quickly. Dogs are gonna need to find mates, engage in courtship and bear and raise young. Um, the mating and reproductive strategies of post-human dogs are not going to probably shift quite as dramatically, though, as their feeding ecology. More puppies. Social organization. So many different forms of social organization could emerge and work in a world without humans including the formation of bonded pairs, small groups, and larger packs. Alternatively, some dogs may live mainly solitary lives coming together with other dogs only when necessary. Cognition and emotion. So dogs have been selectively bred by humans for certain behavioral traits, including a general propensity for friendliness and malleability and breed specific functional skills like hunting, pointing, fetching, herding, and guarding. Selection for these traits has been driven largely by an interest in the physical characteristics of dogs and by the usefulness of these traits um, in relation to human pursuits. And over the past century or two, especially in relation to human aesthetic whims and fancies. Taken outside the context of human-canine relations, some of these physical and behavioral traits may serve well 
dogs well and others um, maybe not so much. And then finally, um, morphology, what would dogs look like? It's hard to say because morphological features are gonna evolve in response to ecological pressures, feeding ecologies and distinct features of the ecological niche that a given population of dogs is filling. Um, dogs are already the most morphologically diverse species on the planet and think here of the difference in size and shape between a little multipoo and an Irish wolfhound. Um, one possibility is that dogs will eventually all get to be medium size. And this is um, my canine friend, Poppy, who we kind of imagined as a sort of prototype dog of the, the future, a post-human dog. Um, another possibility is that dogs will speciate into small and large types. Natural selection almost certainly will weed out physical traits that are maladaptive such as extremely foreshortened skulls and excessive skin folds and extremely short or long limbs. Before I turn things over to Mark, I wanna talk just a couple of minutes um, about the final section of the book, which is about uh, what all of this means for how we live with dogs now. And speaking of, um, I'm gonna let Bella in the door. It's all right. Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so this is a question that kind of hovered in the back of um, the back of the book, the back of our minds as we worked on this book. And it's kind of a difficult question to entertain if you live with dogs, if you love dogs, and if you stand in awe of this friendship that humans and dogs have shared for thousands of years and that you may share with a dog of your own. But I think it's worth trying to imagine for a few moments, not only what your individual dog might gain, but also what all the dogs who currently share the planet with us might gain or lose if they had the world to themselves. And what about post-human dogs of the future who never knew life with humans? Maybe dogs as a species would have a better go of things if this domestication experiment were called off once and for all. Dogs would certainly face challenges, but a post-human post world is also full of what you might call dog possibilities. So part of what we did um, as we were working is we made a list of a kind of tally of all the things that we thought dogs might have to gain or lose if humans disappeared. And yeah, the point of this is not for you to try to read all this tiny little print, but just to show you, and this is just a, a condensed list, actually. Our, our list in the book is quite long. But one thing that was very striking to us was that the gains column, that is to say what dogs have to gain from our disappearance is actually quite a bit longer and more robust than the losses col column, which um, kind of gives you pause. And um, I think it can help us think about the parameters of dog canine relations and bring into focus some of the ways in which we make life hard for dogs, not just the individual dogs with whom we share our homes, but, but dogs in general. You know, just to take a couple of examples, our pet dogs generally don't get to pick their friends or family. They don't get to, to decide when and how to interact with others of their own species or um, of the human species. We um, don't generally let them have the opportunity to choose a mate and raise a family unless we have labeled them a breeder, in which case that might be the only thing they get to do. Um, they don't get to move around very freely. Uh, they, um, they don't get to work to find their own food and shelter, which might sound like a nice thing, but it actually is a deprivation to 
to have nothing to do and no meaningful work. And they don't have the opportunity to respond to varied stimuli from the environment. So the danger is for pet dogs, especially that they have um, lives that aren't that interesting. Not only that, we humans often breed and buy dogs who have traits that make not only post-human survival unlikely, but also diminish their lives right now. And to go back to the example that I mentioned before, dogs with um, extremely smushed faces often have um, a difficult time breathing and have respiratory disease, high rates of respiratory disease. Imagining a future for dogs without their human counterparts is an interesting exercise in biology, but I think the real value of the thought experiment um, is in ethics and in helping us think more clearly about who dogs are in the present and in turn, how we can better give them meaningful and interesting and good lives. So how can we help dogs live experientially rich and interesting lives now within our midst? Those of us who live with home dogs often um, get a lot of benefit from reading some of the many really good books on dog cognition, um, canine science to understand who dogs are and what they need. Um, for example, if you read books on canine sensory capacities, you learn that for dogs, the sense of smell, their olfactory sense is what for us is, is like our eyes. And we're visual creatures and dogs are olfactory creatures. And most dogs who live um, with human companions don't get as much time sniffing as they would like. Um, and they especially don't get as much opportunity to sniff each other's butts as they might like, which um, is actually a really important activity for dogs. So, so that's one thing, but maybe even more important for the average dog guardian would be an exploration of the growing body of research into free ranging dogs around the world. And that really was one of our central aims in a dog's world was to make this research accessible to um, a general audience. And here in these studies of free ranging dogs, we can begin to see dogs not as domesticated playthings, but as animals. Moreover, we can see them as animals who are situated within ecological communities where the center of their world is not necessarily us. So learning about the lives of dogs on their own, we can begin to grasp then the entire range of canine possibilities and can understand how limited the, the four walls of a human home really are. And as one small example of this, um, one of the things that we talk about in the book is use of space. So biologists use the concept of home range uh, which is defined in a classic paper by William Burt as that area traversed by the individual and in its normal activities of food gathering, mating, and caring for young. So research on the home range of free ranging dogs shows really wide variation with some dogs having a home range as small as half an acre and some having a home range as large as 7,000 acres. In contrast to these free ranging dogs, intensively home dogs are highly constrained in the ways they're allowed to use space. They generally don't have anything that approximates a home range. They're rarely allowed to roam. It's typically, it's illegal in most places. Um, and they're considered very lucky if they have a half, half acre backyard um, um, in which to, to move about. So the research on free ranging dogs, as well as other species of canid, sheds light on 
the remarkably interesting, full, exciting lives of dogs on their own. Dogs have a wide range of natural habitats and live alongside humans in diverse ways, but some habitats are decidedly more captive and constricting and don't allow dogs to be dogs in any meaningful way. Some habitats are less obviously captive, but nonetheless might greatly limit a dog's ability to live an interesting life. And I just have a, one concluding um, remark and a number of just gratuitous pictures of dogs because dogs make me happy and I think they make a lot of people happy. So um, ending with some pictures of dogs having a good time. It isn't all that pleasant to think of a world in which we're no longer here. But there are many reasons to believe that when we're gone, dogs will survive and life will go on. It's healthy for us to begin to decenter the human. And when we decenter, then real fruitful, non-anthropocentric non thinking can begin. In imagining who dogs might become without us, we might gain insight into who they are now and how our relationships with them can benefit us both. So we might ask our dogs jokingly, what would you do without me? And they might indulge us with a wag and a bark, all the while imagining the possibilities. And with that, I will welcome Mark to the stage. Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, and thank you for joining us. Um, I actually don't have a lot new to say, but I'll reiterate some points that Jessica um, pointed out because I think they're important to consider um, when we consider how dogs will do without us. Um, dogs are an incredibly diverse species and so are all the canines uh, behaviorally and um, especially morphologically for, um, for dogs. I mean, we've bred them to, 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 do, to do the things we want them to do and to look like we want them um, to look like. So that's a really important point. Um, the other is that we need to remember that dogs came from wolves. So they still have wolf genes and um, engram in their brains. And so some of the behavior patterns that they'll need when they're on their own are probably latent, but, but they're still there. And so they'll have to tap into these um, sort of evolutionary um, memory engrams to do the things they need to do when they become uh, members of wild communities. So we have to remember that they're going to become members of wild communities and that human or artificial selection is going to be replaced by natural selection. Um, it's really hard to predict what's going to go on um, when we're not here. When we asked some people about um, would large dog or would size matter? Would large dogs do better than small dogs? Most people said, well, large dogs would do better, but that's not true because small dogs will, will not have high caloric needs. They could run faster than a lot of the competitors in the wild communities in which they've become members, and they won't need to do very much to get food. They could eat insects and they could find food for which, um, say, other carnivores with whom they'll meet. Um, won't compete. So size is really a very difficult, um, it's, it's difficult to predict size. And I think it'll become very clear as time goes on, although none of us will be here, although I wish I could be that fly on the wall and be here and see what happened, um, is that um, in different locales, depending on the distribution and sort of food they have, dogs of different sizes will likely survive and do um, very well. Um, <clears throat> in, in terms of food, um, I don't know about many of you who are listening, but I've, I've lived with dogs who were really good hunters if, if they get out. I lived in the mountains of, outside of Boulder for years, and they would bring back some animals. And I would really be upset about it, to be quite frank. But I also lived among coyotes, uh, black bears, cougars, and bobcats, and they also were um, 
<laughs> they were pretty good predators. So I think dogs will show a lot of individual variability in the way in which they go get food and whether they're able to get food. First generation home dogs will probably have a difficult time. The free ranging dogs may not, but it's pretty clear that a large percentage of free ranging dogs um, still have some human interference in their lives. And I don't mean interference in a, in a negative way. Um, I've been to Rome and I've seen the free ranging packs of dogs um, near the Rome airport. And there was a woman who would bring out big pots of cooked chicken every morning and the dogs loved her, um, but they still had very little human care and probably few if any got any veterinary care. Um, but there was no, there's no doubt they'll be able to um, become members of wild communities and get food. It may be tough, I mean, in all honesty, but it doesn't mean that they'll all disappear because we're not here. We, te we tend to self-inflate our importance to our dogs, and there's been some studies um, that show that. In terms of sex, they'll be able to flirt and court and mate. Um, they will be able to dig, well, either dig dens or find dens in which to have their um, children, because they are children. Um, my colleagues in science hate when I call the offspring or the young of non-human animals children, but they are their children. And in many ways, they show much more vigorous defense um, of the well-being of their children than do humans. And they'll also have what we call alloparental care, which is basically aunts and uncles and older adults, um, could be siblings and it could be other individuals who have come into their group to um, help them raise young. And, and we already know that. In terms of sociality and social living, they will form packs. Um, there's people, a lot of people write about dogs who have never watched free ranging dogs. They watch a handful of dogs in laboratories or at a dog park and they'll go, dogs don't form packs. They do form packs. There are data that are quite old that show free ranging dogs and feral dogs form packs and the student of mine study dogs in the four corners of Colorado and um, on some reservations and they formed functional packs that resembled um, packs that wolves um, form. And a, a couple of weeks ago, I had the opportunity to spend a, part of a day with Rick, on, Rick McIntyre who studies wolves in um, Yellowstone National Park and he's written a number of really great books and I mean, it's, it's a no-brainer that dogs form packs. One thing that we didn't mention much in the book, but I think it's important for you all, is that humans don't become leaders of packs. Caesar Milan you know, says, become the leader of the pack, and if you have to punish your dog and use aversive techniques, that's fine. I, I thoroughly disagree. The dogs don't look at us like pack members. So from the fact that some people think dogs don't form packs. They're making predictions now that post-human dogs won't form packs, which are coordinated groups where the animals agree to um, hunt together, defend food together, raise babies together. Um, and so they will form packs. And I imagine that in the future, they will form packs that really do resemble the pack structure and organization and the way in which individuals would interact, um, the interpersonal, if you will, or interwolf or interposthuman dog um, relationships. And, and concerning their cognitive and emotional capacities, there's no doubt that they'll be able to do it. I mean, they may get lonely. First generation dogs who have had <clears throat> some contact with humans may get lonely and may not be able to do some of the things they need to do. But as time goes on, I mean, you know, people say, well, their connection with us is in their genes. Well, it may or may not be, but I think a lot of it is manifested because we go into it now with that expectation. So we sort of pride ourselves as being, you know, the oxygen or the lifeline of dogs, when in fact, a huge percentage of dogs, as Jessica said, don't have much um, contact with humans at all. So my, my bottom line is that um, any post-human post dogs will do really well without us. Um, we should 
if you will, step away from thinking that we are the most important beings or things um, in their life. And one of the things that came out when we started writing the book was, and we were asking people about the characteristics of dogs that would be important or how would they do, where people said, well, look at Chernobyl. But it turns out that Chernobyl dogs have had human contact since day one. I hate to call that day one when the nuclear plant exploded. Um, and I'm in contact now with a guy fairly regularly now who lives there and he's doing this PhD thesis out of um, Oxford on the Chernobyl dogs. And they've been, they've been provisioned by humans who were there since day one. So to sum this up, I think they'll do well. And as Jessica mentioned, I think one of the effects of writing this book and thinking about it and talking about it is it's made me reflect on our relationship, my relationship, and if you will, our relationship with dogs right now, and some of the suggestions that we have for, for preparing dogs for doomsday, we call it doomsday prepping, would be to allow dogs to be dogs. I mean, I don't want dogs peeing in my house or humping my leg, but that's what they do. So we have to find situations where we allow them to exercise their senses and to be dogs. But basically living with humans, we're actually selecting out those traits that make them dogs. And will they be able to recall them when they're on their own? I think they will. I mean, it's gonna be hard to know, but like I said before, those wolf genes and wolf engrams in their brains are really, they're just sitting there almost waiting to be uh, tapped into. So anyway, I look forward to questions from you all. So, and thank you very much for coming. Great. Thank you both. And uh, we have both Mark and Jessica on, st on screen now, and I have a bunch of questions from the audience. So I'm going to start with, um, well, well, let's just get started. So uh, there was a couple of questions about uh, genetic changes associated with domestication. Would they be an advantage or a disadvantage? You talk specifically about some things like, I think there was a, a dog or the, the domesticated dogs have the muscles in their eyes that allow them to do the puppy dog eyes versus wolves that don't. Um, can you talk a little bit about the, those changes and if they would be positive or not? Oh, Jessica, you need to unmute. Sorry, I thought Scott was controlling all of our voices. Um, I, my take on that is that it's really hard to know. Um, something like the facial musculature that uh, allows dogs to be able to make these sad puppy dog eyes that solicit attention or are used for begging food from the table um, might be repurposed. Um, it's hard to imagine what they might be repurposed for, but there's no reason to think that they they couldn't be. Um, I think, you know, are they are they maladaptive? Is there something about a trait that's going to get in the way of dogs surviving well? You know, if if all dogs have this trait, it, it's not going to be a barrier to communication uh, among dogs, at least. Um, so I think I think it's really hard to say. And um, you know, if a, a, a trait may just be neutral and not really benefit a dog <coughs> or dogs in general, and not and not be maladaptive, and it, it could just remain in the in the genetic profile of dogs. Um, Mark, you want to add something to that? Yeah, I mean, behavior, behavior evolves much more rapidly than um, anatomical or physiological, say anatomical structures or um, physiological processes. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if, in fact, the, I, I don't even know how to say the ability to do, you know, puppy dog or eyes or other things, it's, it's just there. And it may be called out, you know, when they need it, when they're when they're members of wild communities, or not. But I don't expect that they've really disappeared. I mean, I th I think humans tend to give themselves a lot 
too much credit sometimes for being the reinforcers for certain behavior patterns. And there's enough um, information in the ethological literature that show that certain behavior responses are, they're hardwired. They come out when a particular stimulus is presented. So I, I don't know. Um, might, it might turn out that puppy dog eyes are important um, in courtship. I was thinking about this a few days ago, like when, if, if two dogs come together who don't know one another or dogs meet wolves or coyotes, because they, they can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So um, it's a great question, but the scenario of the book is no one will be here to know, <laughs> which, which is kind of horrible. <laughs> So I'm going to read some of this. I've got my my notes over here. Um, uh, Elise says, I have dogs and cats. If I disappeared tomorrow, I believe my cats would get by. My dog, however, wouldn't stand a chance. She has no remaining prey instincts. I'm sure she's a very good girl, but um, is not aggressive towards the other animals, is older and spayed, and thus not able to reproduce or appeal to a mate. I guess what I'm saying is I'm skeptical of the idea that dogs we currently know would make it on their own. And I, I think that's a good point, but I want to say that I think from reading your book, you're, you're not talking about specific dogs. You're talking about kind of the general dogs and, and a lot of the free ranging dogs would be the ones who would end up staying. Is that correct? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Take it first. Old, yeah, all elderly dogs or disabled dogs are going to have a tough time, but they're first generation dogs. And I think that the point you just made, Amanda, is really good. We're talking about dogs in general. Yeah, there are specific dogs who won't make it. Of all the dogs I lived with, I would say six of them would make it and the others might have, I'm not going to say they wouldn't make it but might have a difficult time. But all dogs, dogs who can't breathe. I mean, you know, the breeds of dog, the breeds of dogs who can't breed or give birth on their own, they're done. I mean, you know, we've, we've introduced these dogs into the world because we're there to help them. So yeah, I mean, we're using dogs generically, but you know, you never know. Um, dogs give care to disabled and dogs in need. And so too do wolves and coyotes um, and, and other carnivores with whom they may interact, you know, in, in wild communities. So I, I'd be really careful about making any generalization other than, yes, maybe sick dogs, disabled dogs, older dogs who can't get around and take care of themselves, or dogs who can't breathe or breed, um, they would not make it. Yeah, and I would add, I mean, I'm basically just agreeing with Mark, but I mean, one of the things that was brought home to me over and over in this writing of this book was don't make any assumptions. And, you know, there are little, cute, fluffy white dogs who you might think, not a chance, who could, I think, pull out all the punches and really surprise us. Um, so, although we do talk about dogs in general, we also do talk about individual dogs. And one of the things we did when we started was ask a bunch of people that we knew or people that we didn't know that we ran into at the dog park, you know, what, how do you think your dog would do? And it was very interesting to, um, to hear the responses. And I'd say, I mean, it was pretty, maybe pretty even, but you know, a lot of people thought their dog would, would probably do okay. Um, and even, you know, the a little white dog in a New York City apartment who has her nails trimmed and goes pee on a fake turf might surprise us and might have this, this uh, her inner inner wolf waiting to emerge. Yeah. It's funny you say I, that. I, I, there I, was... I totally agree. Yeah, I mean, what, once again, I mean, I've been in New York City, you know, and I've met these pampered dogs who have, you know, clothes on when it's cold and all they want to do is get those dumb jackets off of them, if you will. Um, so I think we, she, Jessica's right. I mean, we should just give them a little more credit, not only for, you know, what they're, well, for what they're able to do, but what's laying latent in their genes. Like I said, biologically behavior changes much more rapidly than genetics 
or um, physiological processes or anatomy. So they've got a lot going for them, dogs. But a lot of people just, and I think there's a control issue there too, that, you know, they just, they want to feel like they're the most important being in someone's life. So they pick a dog who, of course, is going to run up and pant and tell them how wonderful they are. Yeah, and I saw I saw a little um, comment pop up on the screen about a little white dog, you know, becoming quickly becoming somebody's dinner when left on their own. And yeah, there is that. But, you know, one of the things we talk about in the book is how being very small has some advantages. You can hide a lot more easily if you're small. You can fit into small spaces, holes, um, cubbies. And so, you know, some of the predictions, oh, big dogs will do better or, you know, little dogs will do better. I think all of those are um, up for debate. And um, the, those fluffy little white dogs, I, I got to give them, I got to three cheers. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's, all, there's also there's also a concept in, in ethology called prudent predators and you know a lot of people think oh these animals like wolves or cougars or other carnivores just go out and randomly hunt and it's hit or miss it's not they process a lot of information recently somebody who knows nothing about wolves said well they don't really coordinate their behavior and hunt as a unit well of course they do but the person who wrote about them never even i i he probably never even watched a captive wolf. But the fact of the matter is that, um, you know, these animals are doing a lot of calculations in their heads when they're, when they're heading off, say, on a, on, on, on a field trip to go get food. And they, they do make assessments. I'm not saying that they do the math of saying, well, that little white dog only gives me 30 calories and I'm going to expend a thousand. But they know when to give up and people have studied that. So I, once again, I mean, I think there's a lot of, you know, sort of anthropocentric um, elitism, if you will, that's put out there. Um, but I, th I think people will be surprised except, damn it, there won't be any people around. So I'm, I'm volunteering to be the last human on earth because you know what, I'm somewhat of a recluse and I think I can handle it. <laughs> There's uh, some questions about purebred dogs, such as sporting breeds. Um, will they have a better or worse chance than mixed breed dogs? Can you talk a little bit about that? Hmm. Should I start? Or... Um, sure, go I for it. It doesn't matter. I mean, um, well, there's this phenomenon called heterosis and hybrid vigor in biology. So, you know, from the ground up, you might suggest that these hybrid dogs would do better. Um, I actually don't see why pure, some purebred dogs wouldn't do really well uh, unless they can't either breathe and run. You know, one of the things that's going to happen to dogs is they're going to have to go through some physical conditioning. Not all dogs. I mean, the, the feral dogs and free-ranging dogs my students studied ran constantly all day because we'll, we call them cursorial predators. They're runners. Um, but if they can get the physical fitness in, then, yeah, I think they might be able to you know, to do well. But, but the problem is, is if you're a, a long dog with short legs and you can't get the exercise in, um, you're not, you're not going to make it. I mean, it's, it's, it's a sad, it's sad, but <laughs> you, you're not going to make it. So once again, I think it's really hard to make predictions, um, but it invites interesting questions like this. Yeah, I, I would add uh, just a couple of random notes to that. I mean, one is that I, I think one thing that would make a difference is the, the level of inbreeding within um, sure. a given, I mean, some purebred dogs are highly inbred and they just um, tend to have more, um, more health problems come up and um, some purebred dogs who are, for example, Mark was getting at this, used for herding or um, hunting, fetching, um, they are already pretty physically fit. Um, they're they're sort of more ready for um, the apocalypse maybe than pet dogs who 
who aren't working. Um, so I think it depends a little bit on what what breed of dog and what sort of what um, what function the breed of dog has. And so it's a good question. It's a really good question. In the book, you were talking about uh, Bernese Mountain Dogs in Phoenix or um you know greyhounds in alaska i imagine that there's going to be uh or there would be some uh evolutionary not choices because it's not a choice but evolutionary uh pressures based on which dogs are where and what kind of environment they're uh weather type environment they're in right yeah well, i mean down the line there the, the, that will sort itself out there's a number of rules there's bergman's rules there's allen's rules that look at like size and latitude or longitude and you know uh, and and um, weather but but that'll sort itself out but once again there are always these exceptions you know i mean when i studied coyotes for years you know after eight years we were still learning things and we were our minds were blown because at one point we would say, you know, we, we'll never see that behavior or these, this particular individual survive. And the young pup who, I don't think he was deformed, but there was something wrong with him. Well, we know he lived at least three years because he got great help from mom, dad, and aunts and uncles. So I think, once again, I think, you know, from the studies of free ranging dogs that exist now, we ought to cool our jets because a lot of the thoughts about how they will do comes back to thorough anthropocentrism, that we're the center of the universe, human exceptionalism, and, and that's not the case. So I expect that there'll be trends in terms of size and breed and other, you know, other morphological and life history characters, but I don't think we should say all or none right now. Yeah, and I would, um, I mean, the, the concept of a land race, um, these groups of dogs who have um, evolved you know, through some artificial selection, a lot of artificial selection, not complete. Um, like, you know, Tibetan dogs who help with, that help people hunt on the Tibetan plateaus. These dogs are um, exquisitely, adapted to the geographic region um, in which they live. And there's something about that that seems very right. And those dogs, I think, are going to have a distinct edge. When you, I mean, one of the things that's very odd about the way we keep dogs now is we do a lot of this uh, geographical <laughs> sort of transcription. So we take a, um, a, an Alaskan Husky and be, we live in Tempe, Arizona, but we really want an Alaskan Husky, so we get one. Um, and there are a lot of things we can do to help the dog compensate for that mismatch between um, the dog's coat and feet and so forth and what Tempe, Arizona is like. But you know, in some ways you could say, well, it doesn't really do dogs favors to take them so far outside of their, their geographic um, comfort zone or what they morphologically where they are most comfortable and you know certainly an Alaskan um, Malamute or a Husky in Tempe when the rapture occurs and all humans disappear is gonna have a really hard time and same with the Chihuahua who's in Anchorage um, and maybe that that's something to think about now in the way we purchase and keep dogs is trying to get a little bit better match to between type of dog and and where we live and and our lifestyle getting a super lazy dog if we are super lazy ourselves and you know not not getting a vishla if our if we're couch potatoes and so forth well, it's also important because in the book, but other people have made these predictions, you know, dogs aren't going to go back to being wolves I think post-human dogs, but they also won't be as large as wolves. So coyotes, for example, which could approximate or jackals the size of what post-human dogs might look like, live from, if you will, the tropics to, um, you know, Arctic region, region, regions and do really well. 
So once again, they could adapt really fast um, to different habitats. Um, I think it'll be the early Malamute in Phoenix who might have the, the more difficult time. But, if, but the other thing is, you know, from a genetic point of view, if you have a, a small gene pool and certain animals go on and they're passing on certain traits, you know, like size or coat or something like that, then the door's open for um, surprises. Yeah, maybe that's, maybe that's the best way to do it. But I, but I think a chihuahua out in the Arctic would, um, would probably have a difficult time being a happy dog. You've mentioned research on free-ranging dogs a couple of times and uh, have a, a, several questions about that. And I, I wanna mention that obviously in the book, you mentioned something about how it's really hard to do research on, on free-ranging dogs and how some uh, other scientists think that it's not really that relevant to do that. Um, can you talk about that a little bit, both the, the research and kind of the thought around research? It's not hard to do research on free-ranging dogs. I mean, my God, I've been doing it for decades, and so some of my students and others. The scientists don't like it because, well, I'm a scientist. Some scientists don't like it because they'll say it's uncontrolled. You don't have all control of these variables. So I'm going to put 15 dogs in a laboratory and we're going to do something. And then you go, well, wait a minute. They don't do something. And maybe it's because the research is over controlled. And Marco Ada has been told, and he told me I can tell the story. He's been not invited to dog meetings because he studies free ranging dogs and his studies are uncontrolled. And that's just such that it's asinine. I mean, I just have never heard of anything like that because you'll, I'll read studies from labs and say, dogs don't do this. <clears throat> dogs don't have a theory of mind. Dogs don't plan for the future. Dogs don't do this. And I'm thinking, my God, I was at the local dog park for the last weekend. I saw a hundred examples of that. I think your question is a really important one because it's free ranging dog studies that are going to inform, if you will, the future of dogs or post human dogs more than others, but it's the arrogance of people who wanna control everything. So I've, I've partaken in some lab studies and they're really well done. I'm not criticizing the science or the scientists, but, but I watch these dogs and they're bored. You know, they have, a, they just, I've done this before. And, and I really appreciate your a question, Amanda, because I've been criticized for that too. And as has Marco and other people, but the fact of the matter is, studies of free-ranging animals are really important. And those are where the data are going to come from. I mean, like I said, you know, I did some work on captive coyotes, but then we did an eight and a half year study of wild coyotes. We were still learning about things after eight and a half years. And I know Rick McIntyre was telling me a few weeks ago, I mean, he's been out there thousands of hours over 25 years, and they are still learning things about the wolves in Yellowstone. So I think the lab scientists, some of whom I know have never seen a free ranging dog, have to get out of the ivory tower. As Daniel Dennett, a very famous philosopher said, get out of the tower and into the field. Anything you wanna add, Jessica? I mean, I just thought I think, um... Well, two things. One, I, I totally agree with Mark that there's a place for cognition labs, but cognition labs study pet dogs, companion dogs. And that's a great thing about these labs is they're, I love it because the, the research is purely, well, almost purely voluntary on the part of the dogs and the dogs enjoy it for the most part. I think it is also boring, but it's more interesting maybe than sitting around the house all day. Um, and the other thing I was gonna say, if I can remember what it was. Oh, I mean, I, th I think there's a lot of cultural variation in the way people think about dogs. And I'm, I'm just thinking here of certain places around the world and even pockets of the United States where um, dogs are really reviled. Um, there or people are very scared of dogs. Um, feral dogs can be a real problem um, in spread of rabies. So 
I mean, I think there are, you know, dogs are not panda bears, the charismatic megafauna. They're, they're actively disliked um, by some groups of people. And although I suppose a lot of other animals who are the object of study are also disliked, but often if we dislike them, we study how to eradicate them. <laughs> um, so I think it's a very complicated picture with dogs and why, why haven't dogs been studied more? And, um, and now they are, it's, it's picking up, but it's, you know, if you go back into the history books of, you know, the science of history, the study of dogs as anything other than a model for human, like biological, like figuring out human physiology or human psychology, um, like Pavlov's work, that wasn't about dogs. That was about humans using dogs. People didn't, I mean, Darwin said some things about dogs, but people didn't start studying dogs. It's hard to go back and find this whole long um, line of, people doing science on, on dogs and especially not um, free ranging dogs. So it's wonderful that it's changing and opening up and it's, it's exciting. There's also, there's also a reason because biologists have thought that dogs are artificial. They're creations of humans. I mean, I was told that early on in my career that, you know, why, why would people study dogs? You know, we've made them who they are. They're, they're artifacts that you can find that in the literature. So when my, when my student back in the early 80s was trying to get funding to do what has turned out to be classics work on free ranging dogs, he couldn't get a penny because, because the people who want control were saying, well, you're just going to be watching these animals, you know, so it was okay for me to go out and watch wild coyotes, but it wasn't okay for him to watch wild dogs, but he did. And, and like, like Marco's experience and others I can I it's just because they're seen they're still in science and I know this is a science show this proclivity for controlling everything I've had leading primate researchers tell me at really the reason that some of the results they get they don't even think are really important because the animals are bored I mean like I you know I, I'm in one study I watched it was like these dogs would come in and go, gosh, I did this yesterday. And I don't mean that in such a light, you know, glib way. And, and so look, science, science has dim, different forms, a shape of science. And so you've got to know, I mean, Jane Goodall's work, you know, people had such a misrepresentation of chimpanzees until she went out there and she named them and she saw the personalities and she was told, we don't name chip in, we don't name animals and we don't, you know, assign personalities. And, you know, she didn't say it so directly, but since I know her, she said, well, I do. And look at what happened from her research. The elephant research of Cynthia Moss, Joyce Poole, Ian Douglas Hamilton. I mean, seriously, so, so you're right about the dogs, but that's because I think people still think of, uh, were thinking of dogs and still think of dogs as human artifacts, as human companions. But, but the data coming out of India and Italy and Bali and other places about free range dogs is it's phenomenally interesting and it's really important not only to, not only to informing what we want to say about our book, but who dogs are. Dogs are not Fifth Avenue pooches who sleep in soft beds who get crappy food and aren't allowed to sniff and are yanked around by their collar. So, I mean, someone's got to put it out there, but that's the life of a dog, many dogs. Yeah, and I, just one um, funny anecdote, this isn't on dogs, um, the scientific study of dogs, but on the topic of dogs as um, artifacts or unnatural, parts of, they're not parts of ecosystems. I um, came across, I was hiking um, up in the mountains and I came across a sign that said, um, I was on a trail. It said, dog poop is unnatural. Pick up your dog poop, it destroys the environment, which sure, I, yeah, I agree with that. But then 
I mean, that's so weird. I, if I see a coyote poop on the trail or a mountain lion poop, I get really excited. I'm like, oh my God, this wild animal has been here. And if I see a dog poop on the trail, I'm like, that stupid owner didn't pick up their poop. Um, and it's such a different, dogs are very different. They're just seen as unnatural. Wild dog poop looks a lot like coyote poop because the poop of our domestic dogs is from the junk that they're fed. <laughs> Sorry, so I'd probably but... get really excited if I saw a wild dog poop, especially in Colorado. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> that would be quite a thing. Yes, I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> I see the comment, I, I pick up bear poop. Is that is that a serious comment? <laughs> I carry extra bear, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't, That's I didn't really cute. That. You'd have to have a grocery bag. Well, horses, horses poop all over the biking trails I ride, and I'm sure Jessica rides, and that's okay. I mean, seriously. So, you know, hello. <laughs> anyway, sorry to get yeah. us off track. But no. dog poop is a very serious scientific issue. Yes, it is. <laughs> So from, from one end, talking about uh, free-range dogs to uh, going to go anthropocentric again, uh, Mark, you said that the, the concept of dogs seeing their, their humans as the alpha dog or as part of their pack, um, you don't think that that is, is realistic. How do they see us? <laughs> you know, I don't know. Um, for this book I'm writing, I asked a lot of people, what would you ask your dog? And, uh, and fully 50% said, I want to know how dogs see us. So I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think they go, oh, well, you're just a big brain mammal like I am. Um, but I think your question is a really important one because I think dogs living in certain situations see us very differently. So... I met free range. I, I met free ranging dogs in China, Kenya, Tanzania, and India, and they see. I mean, I don't know this because I tried to have a talk with one of them, but he was extremely nonverbal. But he, these dogs just don't see us in the same way as maybe a home dog do. The home dog does, if you will. You know, people think that these dogs are wild. They're aggressive. They're not, I mean, a big study in India shows that they're really not very stressed and they form very close relationships with humans. And there's been studies to show that they do the same things that lab dogs do in terms of um, say following point, um, human pointing and gesture. So I, I, I don't know how they see us. I mean, I don't think they classify us biologically, but I think they see us based on their own experience. Oh there's a something, you know, I don't even know if they differentiate men from women, but there's a something that looks like that something who gave us food, or there's a something that looks like that something who beat us. And they generalize. And, and I got the feeling from this group I met in Southern India, they, they, that they liked me. I had food. My friend was a veterinarian down there and I had food and I fed them. And after about three days, they came out and said hello to me. I, I actually felt really, I mean, I felt more comfortable with them than I do in groups of dogs who I might even meet around, you know, in the mountains outside of Boulder. And I, and I really mean that. So I don't know how they see us. Um, I don't know. Anything you want to add to that, Jessica? No, I, that was a good answer. <laughs> Fair. So I, I have just one or two more questions, but I, I, well, as my penultimate question, anything, any kind of high level points about the book or about this topic that you want to leave our viewers with? Mark? Oh, you can go first on that one. Th that, that they should buy it, read it. No, I'm serious. So, and, and get the message out of it. I mean, I actually... I mean, I think it's, I mean, to me, in all honesty, it was, Jessica and I, this is our fourth book, um, and we've written other books before. At some point, this was the more diff the most difficult, not because it wasn't fun, 
but you know, I'm I'm not sure. I mean, I just I just hope that it makes people, I don't mean makes in that way, but I hope it makes people revisit their relationship with dogs, you know, right now. And we'll come away, we'll, we'll come away allowing dogs to be dogs. I mean, my goodness, we, I don't mean we necessarily us, but we train the dog, we, when you, we train the dog out of dogs. We teach them not to be dogs. And so one thing that I comes away and I actually said this to somebody today and they were, I think they were a little off put by it is, you know, these are who dogs are. They're complex sentient beings. They have needs and desires and wants and beliefs and theories of mind, rich emotional lives. If you don't think you're ready to get a dog, don't get a dog. It's a huge responsibility. And if the bottom line is that people decide, you know, I'd love to live with a dog, especially during the pandemic, you know, there's big problems with that, then I'm not going to get a dog because I cannot do for that dog what he or she needs to be a dog. Yeah, I, um, I kind of second what Mark said. I mean, it, this was a, a challenging book to write, but of, I've written a lot of books and a lot of books about dogs. And this book made me think more differently about my relationship with Bella, my dog, than anything else I've done. I think the main thing that it did for me was really unsettle my assumptions about what dogs want. I mean, I, I had, you know, I grew up in the United States and in a home with dogs and I've always had dogs and it just seems like a very natural thing for me. And I think part of that um, narrative for me was that dogs want to be with us and that the, a dog's purpose um, in life is to be, you know, so their, their telos is to be a, a pet. <laughs> you know, that's, that's a good life for a dog and that dogs who are on their own are missing out. They're, suddenly they're sick or and none of those things are true and you know in, in many ways I think um, the dogs who live in intensively home situations have the hardest lives um, and it really made me much more acutely aware aware of the the constrictions that homed dogs are under and suggested so many ways to think differently about um, living with a dog. And Mark mentioned, I think, the number one, which is, you know, in dog training. So if you look at the veterinary literature and, um, you know, the reasons that people go to veterinary behaviorists or trainers, um, and incidentally, about 80% of people mm -hmm. who live with a pet dog um, will report that their dog has at least one behavioral problem, mm -hmm. which I find astonishing. Like people are not happy with their dog's behavior. Um, and the things that they are unhappy with are natural dog behaviors. Um, so just if, if people could shift their expectations about what it means to live with a dog, that it actually means living with an animal, um, and an animal who has, for example, fur that might get on your couch and an animal who might bark um, and an animal who has a need to, um, to be an animal, it's, I think it could be much better for dogs. So, and ultimately I'm, as an ethicist, those are the things that um, keep me up at night and make me feel better when I can have more clarity about how to, how to live better with, these amazing beings. And, I think and, they could live without us, but I'm not sure we could live without them. Yeah, and I think, so, what, I think what Jessica that. said is really important in that, and I, I was hinting at it before, but she said it really explicitly. You know, we're making dogs not be dogs. We're, we're punishing them for dog appropriate behaviors. You know, like I said before, I don't want my dog peeing in the house, but when my, when my dog goes outside or I see dogs outside and they want to just put their nose to the ground for 40 or 50 seconds, let them do it. 
And I don't want them to hump my leg, but I had somebody say, well, I don't like it because they're trying to dominate me. Humping's not at all about dominance necessarily. It could be, it could be about a lot of things. So um, <laughs> it's just what they do. I mean, wild wolves hump one another, dog, coyotes hump one another. And I'm not saying I want a dog humping my leg, but, but I'm really serious about it. It's part of their behavioral repertoire. They do it. So find a place where you can allow them, uh, allow them to do dog things um, and let them be dogs. Because what we're doing is we're selecting out the things we don't like. And I think, it's, I think it, it causes psychological problems. A woman at a dog park once asked me, do you think that pulling dogs away from sniffing causes psychological problems? And at first I thought she was really joking me. No, I don't. If I'm looking at something and you got a rope around my neck and you're yanking me away, you're depriving the dog of very keen information that they're getting from where some other dog urinated. Yeah. So we're asking for a paradigm shift. And I think a, a huge one in terms of dog human relationships. And that it's living with a dog is a process of co-adaptation. Mm -hmm. We often, we expect them to do the all of the adapting to us, but it, we've got to adapt to them and meet them in the middle. It's a process of collaboration, of curiosity. We need to be curious about them, um, and compassionate toward them. So, um, yeah. That's fantastic. I am really glad to hear you say that. And as our final question, I, I prompted you this in advance, but I have been asking all of our Science on Tap speakers to answer the question, why do you feel that it's important for people to learn about science? Well, I, I can go first on this one. Um, a philosopher. <laughs> since I'm not a scientist. Um, I am a, in the sense that my home field of bioethics is really, um, we straddle the border between science and ethics as kind of our job um, to be able to speak in both camps. Um, and the reason for, for that and the, the reason for the birth of this field is that, um, you know, without ethical reflection, science can go wrong. Um, it can be, it can lack compassion. Um, and without science, ethics can be ungrounded and um, ineffective and, and actually even wrong. Um, so if you, taking the example of dogs, if you, if you don't know anything about this, science of who dogs are, your chances of um, giving them the best possible care, I think, decrease. Um, because to take uh, two little specific examples, you know, if you learn about um, how, uh, learn about dogs' ears, the science of dogs' ears, you learn that they're extremely sensitive. Their hearing is far more sensitive than ours. Um, and Knowing that, you can think about the soundscape of your home. You know, if you're always playing Ozzy Osbourne on 11, that's going to be really painful for your dog. And, you know, fire alarms that beep in the night and all sorts of um, sounds that we may not be bothered by might be quite um, stressful and intrusive to our dogs. And um, we've talked about smell. A number of times, but you know, if you didn't know how how important smell was for dogs, you might get annoyed going on a walk with your dog, and your dog wants to stop every two seconds and stick her nose in some other dog's pee or in a flower. You don't use like well, there's nothing there. Let's go. But if you are armed with some science about the canine nose, you're just able to say, oh, she is very busy. Um, reading P-mail, a term Mark and I use in our last book, Unleashing, um, leaving post-it notes for other dogs and really is doing important work and it makes her happy to be able to do that. So I think um, science just in relation to animals helps us have a, a grounded compassion and empathy. And so that's my answer. Yeah. Uh 
I'm being more generic. Science is fun. I love being a scientist. It's, it's just fun to learn things. Um, you know, I just made some notes, you know, um, it really feeds into curious minds. Um, science should make you open-minded, but a lot of scientists hook onto what I call boring paradigm science that their mentor and their mentors, mentor, mentors did. And, it, you know, it doesn't, at least for me, it doesn't really open the door up to anything, but the same old, same old. Um, but it's fun. Um, I think that people, I, I mean, people know this, but I think maybe coming from a scientist, it's not perfect. It doesn't necessarily result in truths about the world, but to me, one of the most exciting things, and I guess you could see it in, in dogs, um, but all other animals, because I, I, I did field work for um, a season on a deli penguins in Antarctica. And, you know, they, people would say, oh, you know, that's interesting. You go to Antarctica, it's really nice, but they all look the same. No, they don't all look the same. They don't all sound the same. They, they have personalities. And, you know, people who laugh at that, but it's opening the door in, in, to the non-human world to where people are also finding out personalities in spiders. I mean, reptiles have really rich and deep emotional lives. And we wouldn't know that without science, if you will. And, and somebody might say, you know, how do you define science? Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure that there's 80,000 books in the library up at CU that would be the most boring things in the world to read about how science is defined. But it, to me, it's just asking questions, being inquisitive, being curious, assessing the information that you get, like, like bringing it back to dogs that most lab studies of dogs are a handful of dogs in very controlled situations asking, being asked to do certain things. Just because they don't do it doesn't mean they can't do it. So science to me is just a way of seeing the world, but not in such an, I, I suppose I'd say not in such a closed anal way, but generating questions upon questions. And in the field of ethology, you know, Nico Tinbergen and Conrad Lorenz and Carl von Frisch won the Nobel prize. Tinbergen asked questions and devised really cool field experiments. Lorenz probably never collected one piece of data and never published a graph. And, and, and Carl von Frisch discovered the round dance and the waggle dance in bees for you know, how they found food. They won the Nobel Prize in 1973 for physiology and medicine, and people were really upset. And I mean, I was around just at the beginning of my career at a meeting where people said, I can't believe those people, they're like stamp collectors. And I would say, oh, no, no. They're scientists, they just won the Nobel Prize in physiology and medicine. And, but I meant it, you know? so I think science opens the door to just looking at the world in a very open way, appreciating what data mean and don't mean, and maintaining curiosity. And I, I ride my bike around Boulder in, um, for the last couple of months there's been groups of kids on one of the bike paths uh, or one of the, yeah, one of the trails we ride on out there doing field work. And one little girl, um, I, I knew one of the teachers or, or they knew me and, and, the, and I stopped and the teacher said, oh, he used to teach at um, you know, University of Colorado. And this little six-year-old girl says, look, I'm doing science. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for sharing your knowledge about dogs and information about your book. And yeah, I, I really appreciate your time and your information. This has been fascinating. So thank you. Thank you for your thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah it's been fun. This Great. is fun. Yeah, this is fun. <laughs> well, I, I wish that we could have you on a stage and actually give you a, a pint I'm of on. some sort of adult beverage, but hopefully at some point oh, in the oh. future. So. Yeah, you owe <laughs> us. I just finished mine. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, um, thank you. And um, I am going to share my slides again here and just finish up with a few things. Hold on. Okay, and if you are interested in checking out the book, which I recommend, again, go to Broadway Books and get a 15% discount on the book through December 1st using the code STDOGSWORLD15. 
and we have uh, we needed to reschedule our December event. So our next Science on Tap event isn't going to be until January, and it's going to be another one on uh, animals. Only this time it'll be insects. So what insects do and why? With Dr. Ross Piper, who's an author, entomologist, zoologist, and explorer, should be fun. Just a quick uh, note of thanks to all of our Patreon supporters. You are all wonderful and helping us keep this going. So thank you for that. And uh, brief, well, our final slide is um, if you enjoy what we do, we appreciate all of the tickets everyone purchased. You're welcome to come to our events for free. Um, if you can throw a couple bucks our way, we'd be very grateful. And um, yeah, we hope to uh, have be back in some theaters in actual in person sometime in the new year so stay tuned and we will hopefully be doing that soon so again thank you to mark and jessica and thank you all for being here this evening so see you next year i guess yeah thanks have a good evening <laughs>